trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestsellers, all they're hyped up to be. The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. And welcome to episode 117 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris, and this is Chris. Hello. This time we read Hidden Sins by Selena Montgomery, who you may know as former Georgia State House Rep and current voting rights activist Stacey Abrams. This was published by HarperCollins in 2009. We chose this book for the show because we figured there's got to be a catch to Stacey Abrams. She can't be perfect, right? Her political career is intense and noteworthy, but surely her romance novels are trash. <laughs> Plus, we've read a lot of books by conservative or extreme right-wing authors where their politics were evident in their work, and we were curious to know if the same would be true for someone on the left side of the political spectrum. If this is your first time listening to The Terrible Book Club. What we do here on this show is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover, title, summary, or some combination of the three. Um, and then sometimes we also read books that our patrons, listeners, or friends recommend. In general, we do the opposite of what most people do when they are in a bookstore or while they're browsing the internet looking for an ebook. Usually this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while we actually end up liking the book. All right, for content warnings today, in addition to our usual barnyard language, we are going to be discussing general action movie levels of violence, uh, child abuse, infidelity, religious cults, Brief sexuality, and there is one mention of sexual assault. Okay, um, I can do the back of the book summary and some of the characters and setting here. Alrighty. For the back of the book, New York Times best-selling author and Nobel Peace Prize nominee Stacey Abrams, writing under her pen name Selena Montgomery, tells a chilling tale of lost love, dark family secrets, and hard-won redemption. Mara Reed has been stirring up trouble since she was 18, running scams, living on the edge, always on the run. Now, when two thugs are after her with murder on their minds, she's forced into hiding in her small Texas hometown. But as she's cornered in an alley, only seconds from death, an unexpected rescuer comes to her aid. A forensic anthropologist, Dr. Ethan Stewart, is investigating a gruesome discovery. Nearly 100 dead bodies dating back 50 years a mystery linked to the church once headed by Mara's father. Ethan needs Mara's help. She needs his protection. Their search for a shocking, devastating truth could lead them to forgiveness and salvation if they survive. Okay, so for some characters, of course, we have Mara Reed, the protagonist. Um, you have her grandfather, Reverend Micah Reed, who led a crew of criminals i suppose is the best way to put it who pulled a gold heist on a government train and those crew members were reese bailey poncho and guerva uh, this happened in the late 1930s um and then we have the reverend reed mara's father um, who is the leader of uh, his particular sect of this sort of religious cult that Mara grew up in and was a part of. You have Iko Reed, Mara's grandmother, who helped out her grandfather a little bit with the hiding of the gold that we mentioned before, or that you heard about here. Mm -hmm. um, then you have Dr. Ethan Stewart, of course, Mara's love interest. You have Arthur Rabb and Seth Guffin, some goons that are on the tail of Mara and Davis Conroy, their boss, who has hired them and Ethan, turns out. Um, then you have Sebastian, Mara's friend, who just kind of swoops in at the end to help them out. And then you have Leslie, a friend of Ethan's and also possible budding love interest. 
All right. Thank you, Chris. Now that we know our players, do we want to tell the people what the book is? Yes, indeed. So this is just a small summary that we wrote to help you feel as if you might know what's going on when we bounce from point to point here instead of us struggling to keep our points in story order. Yeah, and so this is where I would just give a little warning. If you're interested in reading Hidden Sins by Selena Montgomery, Stacey Abrams, maybe skip the section because uh, obviously there's going to be <laughs> spoilers. Although, I don't know. it's I feel like it's kind of a fun story. So maybe even if you know the details, it might still be fun. But anyway, this is just your spoiler warning. Mara Reed is a lifelong con artist, splitting from ruse to ruse while managing to only just sustain herself and stay ahead of anyone who she's crossed. This time, she's finally tracking down the whereabouts of her grandfather's hidden cache of gold coins and religious artifacts that he and his crew stole decades ago. Her grandfather, Micah Reed, had the gold hidden in a safe with a four-key mechanism that destroys the gold inside and the person opening it with acid if the keys aren't inserted in the correct order. Each member of the crew hides their key somewhere without telling the others where it's hidden. Many, many layers here. The coordinates to the keys are coded in Greek letters and tattooed on the hip of each man. The intent here is that after some time, the men will meet again to recover and split the gold, since it's a government, since they stole it from a government train, you know, they want to make sure they're, they're in the clear. However, as these things go, one member, named Reese, betrays the rest and attempts to kill them all to have the gold all to himself. Flash forward to the present. Mara Reed is on the run from Arthur Rabe and Seth Guffin. Two hired goons who are seeking the same thing she is, clues to the whereabouts of Micah Reed and his crew's stash of gold. Mara has gained the attention of Davis Conroy, uh, Arthur and Seth's employer, after she absconded with a journal full of clues to the whereabouts of the keys, as well as one of the actual keys that Arthur had stolen from a friend of Mara's after assaulting and murdering her. Mara makes it to her old hometown of Key of Texas and is rescued just in the nick of time by her ex, Ethan Stewart. Ethan and Mara have a testy catch-up session where it is revealed that Mara left Ethan suddenly in the middle of the night while also stealing all of his savings nearly a decade ago without ever telling him why. Turns out Mara was actually just escaping the clutches of her father's religious cult and wanted to protect Ethan by not telling him anything about her escape or taking him with her because she knew her father would hunt him down if she did. Reverend Reed was a zealot obsessed with numerology, codes, and his particular oppressive branch of Christianity. He branded members of the cult with Greek letters that indicated his perception of that cult member, but it also may have been clues to the location of the keys. Davis Conroy found these bodies and hired Ethan, a respected forensic anthropologist, to derive any data he could so Conroy could obtain the keys to get the safe and the gold. Ethan and Mara keep all of this from each other, despite the immediate reignition of the flame they had. I'll also note that uh, Ethan is interested in this because he knows about the religious artifacts that are also hidden with the gold, so that's why he's pretty keen to take on this assignment. Um, you know, being a forensic anthropologist, he's really interested in those that old stuff. Now, we're at the point where Rabe and Guffin are staking out the warehouse, but Mara escapes with the help of an old high school friend turned police officer, Linda, who just happens to appear conveniently when she's needed. She's able to sneak back into Ethan's warehouse, where they hole up in an attempt to outlast the duo outside. Ethan has a guest, and possibly new girlfriend, Leslie, coming to meet him in a few days, so he hatches a plan to sneak her in with a convenient hidden tunnel and an escort from police officer Linda. In the meantime, Mara and Ethan put together clues from the journal and Ethan's research in order to start untangling the location of the keys and the safe. Mara also takes him to her father's old church, using, once again, the secret tunnel to leave unnoticed, where an old sign written in Greek still stands. Mara realizes this may be a clue, and they begin digging near the sign, finding one of the keys in the process. The sign and a note with the key point them in the direction of the others, and they return to the warehouse to prepare for Leslie's arrival and put together the data they have, including the fact that Ethan is unknowingly working for the same man who is after Mara. Leslie arrives, is filled in on the details, an escape plan involving the burning down of the warehouse is hatched, and the trio leave to find another key they have determined is most likely in a cave system nearby. Leslie happens to take trips to that very system often, as she is a geologist, and is able to talk her way past security in order to search the caves without any tourists hanging around. The final key is found. Ethan and Mara make out about it. Leslie see this, sees this but takes it in stride. Uh, with this, they have... Three keys, which, according to a passage in the journal Mara has, may be all they need to open the safe. 
Rave and Guffin are still hot on the trio's tail, but they are able to elude them and drop Leslie off at an airport before making a break for where they think the safe is located. Having deduced it from the map that was embroidered into a quilt that Mara's grandmother Aiko gave them along with some clues. I know, this is a lot. They are able to get to the safe, but only after learning Leslie has actually been captured by Davis Conroy after all. Having found the gold, they hatch one last scheme. They bring the safe to Conroy in exchange for Leslie. However, they have already removed the gold with the correct keys and sequence. They are able to escape Conroy's clutches with the aid of Sebastian, a friend of Mara's who just happens to be able to appear at just the right moment. Conroy, of course, greedily attempts to open the safe with the incorrect key sequence and is doused with acid. Ethan and Mara ride off with the gold into the sunset while Leslie returns home. Okay, so that's quite a lot of different threads to kind of keep track of, and we admittedly try to generalize as much as possible. Um, because I will say that the mystery slash thriller aspect of this book is pretty well done. Yeah, do we? So we're going to talk about things that were good first. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I was very interested just reading the sum like the back of the book summary. I was like, oh, this sounds interesting. Um, and I got to say, like, there is always something going on. It's like action, action, action. The pacing is really good. And I felt very like invested in the mystery. And I felt like I couldn't really, I had trouble kind of guessing what was going to happen next, which is great for me. I love that because um, like, I don't know. I was reading it and was like, okay, your dad's clearly kind of crazy, you know, and is an asshole. I have the bodies with the tattoos, and I'm like, but what is this, what is this about? And like from the opening scene, you know the tattoos must be somehow connected to the treasure, but then I don't know. I just thought that it was really well built, the whole mystery thriller aspect, like you like you just said, Chris. The way uh every bit of them figuring out what the next step is is pretty well done. There's a lot of scenes where Ethan and Mara are working together to sort of piece together the data they have and find the next step that they have to take. Um, obviously, this is interspersed with tons of scenes of Ethan and Mara alternately kind of getting pissed at each other, but then liking each other again. But then they're a little pissed at each other again, but then they like each other again. Yes. Which, you know, after a decade apart seems sort of reasonable. And in, yeah. like, a lot of that stuff, back to the pacing, despite the fact that half this novel takes place in the warehouse where Mara and Ethan are just kind of hanging out for a while, figuring stuff and out. And researching, yeah. And, and researching things. Um, the way the sort of romance scenes are interspersed with them figuring things out, I think are doled out in just the right way to make it interesting when, I, when I'm starting to get bored of them, you know, having another argument where they just won't talk to each other and tell each other things. Um, it switches back into them figuring out the plot or they get hooked back into each other when they're about to be like, there's a lot of times where they're like, you know, actually, fuck you. I'm out of here. But wait, I, I kind of need your help to figure this yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think that even though this is a romance novel, the horny levels are like remarkably restrained, you know, um, and eh, I might I think, disagree with you a little bit on that, but. Chris, let's think about all the romance novels we've read where every other page is the main character's bone and down. This was mostly about the mystery. And of course, the interpersonal relationship between Mara and Ethan is is very, um, you know, is, is like a, a primary aspect of the fabric of this story. But them actually like having sexy stuff happen, I felt was. It was well done and it. It didn't happen so much that I was annoyed by it. And there's really only one kind of long sex scene towards the end of the book. So I think we might have different levels of what we understand as horny things here, because you're saying there's like only a couple of sex scenes, but like in every other chapter where Ethan and Mar together, they're looking at each other's bodies and sort of going like, and then he touched me and I felt the electricity through my body. Like that's happening pretty frequently. Yeah, which sure. To but me reads as like sexual tension and horniness. Well, it is, but I think that uh, in the context of this story, it makes sense. Like what you were saying, you know, these people were intensely in love 10 years ago and a kind of a tra tragic circumstances uh, ripped them apart. So they're coming back together and it just seems more believable to me and less like yeah, the author inserting like horny yes. time, which this is, is where I, this is where I yeah. 100% agree with you, where that Maybe that's tension to is to. integral to their interpersonal relationship and thus yep. the pacing of the story. It's not just kind of tacked on 
for the sake of, well, this is mostly a romance thing and they have to be horny for each other. Yeah, and the sex scenes, I think, are the the long sex scene at the end, I think, is really tasteful. You know, this isn't a romance book where you're going to get, and then he pounded her pussy for, for 10 hours. Like, that's not yeah. how the scenes that's are written. Not the, it's um, not a jerk-off romance, I think. No, uh, it's definitely written as, like, two people who are in love and passionate, and it is, yeah, it's just way more realistic than any other okay, hold on. novel Paris, we've read. are we turning a corner all of a sudden? Because, like, last episode, we read, the like, one of the first romance things out Oh, my there, God. So. And this one also has Greek letters in it. I didn't yes. even think about that. We can officially, <laughs> like, but like I said last time, we can officially have opinions on romance now, despite the we fact can. that it's kind of a genre we don't like. We've read enough of them at this point, I think, to start I having agree. sort of the palette for it. And reading, like, the origin of them as well give us a little bit more context for these tropes, I would think, despite the fact that that was like, what, 3,000, 2,000 years old, that last one that we read. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, anyway, those, those are some good things. Uh, I think I just also wanted to point out that I felt the, I know Chris and I disagreed on this, but I actually felt the intro chapter hooked me immediately because the book opens with a, a woman tattooing in a Texan circus tent in 1937 and I was like what the fuck is going on this is wild okay I, no, I, don't, I don't disagree with you on that I actually agree that that kind of oh, pulled okay. me in too oh I just remember when we were talking about it initially you said you didn't agree but maybe your mind changed I guess I, as you read I think more. I'm, that is indeed the case um yeah so I I mean it, it, get, it really hooks you right away I think the back of the book description is also pretty intriguing um, and yeah, I, I feel like it was really well balanced between the romance and the action um, and kind of the mystery part. So a big clue that we here at TBC don't just hate sex and love. It's we don't like it when it's needless to the broader story. When yeah, it's and actually woven in appropriately, yeah. totally fine with that. Yeah. Also, hey, you know what helps? Having fucking realistic characters who talk like people and have convincing internal monologues and speech I might with others. With you in terms of Mara, but you know that's kind of her quirky character nature. Oh, sorry. What? I might disagree with you from a Mara standpoint, but she's explicitly sort of talks quirky and very dorky. She is a dorky con artist. That's essentially her character. I don't. I mean, there's only that one element of her which we'll talk about in a second where she had these has these bizarre turns of phrase but um i i don't think that that makes her unrealistic i think that's a very no not it doesn't make her whole whole character unrealistic it's just like this one portion of it is not how people normally talk but that's her character quirk i suppose well and it's also ex anyway let's just talk about it since we're arguing about it right now <laughs> so mara um because of her religious upbringing obviously she wasn't super into being in a fucking cult but she is religious she does believe in god presumably um you know i guess the christian some version of the christian god and because of that she doesn't swear she even though she's a con artist she doesn't swear so she says these these hilarious kind of bizarre things like ah crickets and rain <laughs> rats toenails like and and at it's first incredibly dorky before before you get the explanation you're like the fuck that's weird is that like something people say in texas you know that was my first thought as <laughs> as a northerner i'm like is that something are these texan ferns they're all down there going all oh, rivers and creeks yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, but then shortly shortly after we're after a few of these happen it explains yeah she just doesn't want to swear and i was like honestly i thought that was a really great um way to give her a little flavor and I, I thought it was fine. The only one I really took issue with, with was Crapadopolis. And I was like, dude, that's please it's like incredibly I, cringe and dorky. It's so bad. <laughs> I was that like, is Can Mara. Honestly, to me, Mara is incredibly cringy and dorky in a way, but that also kind of makes her interesting because she's not like smooth talking con artist all the time. She's right. actually a complete dork. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I guess I was just like, can we get more like crickets and rain and less <laughs> crapodopolis? But you know, this makes banjos me think and beavers. <laughs> April showers. Um, <laughs> I, so this, but this made me think that. So I am also a dork, although I'm not a con artist. Uh, and when I was, I don't know, some age, but maybe ten or eleven, maybe twelve. Not totally sure. I 
was sort of coming out of my shell. I was I was not a very like boisterous person. I barely talked in school until I was like in sixth grade, I think. So I don't know, eleven or twelve, whatever age that is. And so I started. I don't. I don't. I have no idea like how this happened. I just started talking more and like being more assertive and stuff. And I also figured out that I could be funny sometimes. And if I was funny, people would like me generally. Um, and as like a smart fat kid who everyone hated, I was like, all right, I have a path here. I can be funny and that will get me some social credibility. <laughs> so uh, classic tale. Someday, I don't know what what this is from. I came up with the word craptacular, and I, I you thought you said you coined that one, Paris, like I, you yourself. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I just I don't know. I just said it one day. I never heard it before, and um, I thought it was funny. Everyone thought it was hilarious, but then I just kept saying it. And everyone was so fucking annoyed with me, and it took way too long for me to realize. <laughs> oh, that was like a that was like a one time. They thing. have a diminishing. Like, re- these jokes have a diminishing. Yeah, return. yeah. I so yeah. I too am a fucking dumbass dork who made up stupid words. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think the Bostonian maybe... equivalent of like crickets and rain. Oh fucking! <laughs> ah, donkeys, donkeys and potholes. <laughs> donkeys and rats. <laughs> Ah, culottes and culottes and raccoons. <laughs> <laughs> ah, culottes and mice. I got another parking. <laughs> damn it! Oh, potholes and piss. <laughs> That's a good one too. Oh, although I guess Mara might actually think that piss is a swear. Potholes and pee pee. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, anyway, um, some other things that I thought were great is like. Uh, the scenes that involve forensics and like anthro archaeology actually made sense and were correct as far as I know. So like, holy shit, an author who actually does her fucking research. We've read so many books where authors will just, I don't know, just throw things in their books without checking the science behind them. And it's like, just do a little Googling. Just just go to the fucking internet library. I would, yeah, I wouldn't say anything like, here is super in-depth. Like you have to have inside knowledge. Like you can just probably ask your anthropologist friend how some of this works and they'll give you the general idea of or perhaps your greek linguist friend to give you an idea of what these letters might mean i I, on the other hand we didn't exactly verify things like oh greek letters also have a numeric significance too so maybe that's just an add-on Oh, yeah, I mean, I obviously, like, I wasn't going to fact check this fake religion. I mean, that's not possible. But, um, may, yeah, I don't know. I'm sh- Numerology is a thing. So I sure. I wasn't that worried. I, w- I was more talking about, like, um, how the bones were kept and, like, you know, uh, Ethan being hired as a forensic anthropologist. I don't know. I just feel like in so many books and even, like, me- other media, like TV shows and movies and stuff it's like i don't know people just paint archaeologists and paleontologists anthropologists with like the same brush and it's just kind of all very you one of them smartos yeah you you work with the bones and old (laughs) stuff so you would know the things (laughs) like in the other version of this ethan would know about all the greek letters and things because he's just an academic and he would know that stuff right whereas in this case it makes sense why the hell would he know that stuff if that's not his area of expertise and mara does because she was brought up in and by her you know really um numerologist zealot father yeah (laughs) religious cult leader father so um yeah i just i appreciate the care given with explanations and like not getting too crazy with science or whatever um anyway yeah that was good and uh we were talking a little bit earlier about how we felt the how the mystery was kind of laid out and how they figured out the clues was good and there is one part of this that i i thought was hilarious but in a good way where you know how like when you're watching i don't know some other kind of you know popcorn sort of thriller and suddenly characters figure things out with like no clues or evidence they just like all of a sudden have this light in their eyes and they're like i know 
the treasure is here. And you're like, how the fuck? What? And they're like, oh, I figured it out by like this, this, and this. And it just makes no sense. Well, in this book, they actually get to a point where they're stuck. And they're like, shit, we actually can't figure out like what to do next. Uh, which I felt was pretty good. So Mara's like, well, I need to, I really want to see my grandmother anyway. And she's the only person still living who has any knowledge about any of this. Let's just let's just go ask her. So they drive all the way to her grandmother and basically, you know, they talk to her and she's like, oh, you need, you need more clues, don't you? And they were like, no. <laughs> and she just whips out. She's like, hey, Mara, remember that quilt you've had since you were a baby? That's, that's the treasure map. And Mara's <laughs> like, oh my God, God damn it. So like, they, you know, now that, now that, uh, their grandmother has clued them in on the fucking map being, uh, or the the quilt being the treasure map. They they then they can continue on their way. But I thought it was pretty funny that they actually got stuck, didn't know what to do, and then had to like ask for help from someone. Yeah, I agree. It was, and also for something that is a fairly, uh, for something that is a sort of a trope that is used fairly often in thrillers and like, oh, the thing that you've had for a while is actually the final piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And it's still fairly, and like a lot of this stuff is, you know, general thriller plot constructions. And that can be fine. It doesn't have to be super highbrow stuff as long as it fits together nicely. Yeah. And like when you understand why the, you know, and it's not like, Oh, I just decided to put the map on a quilt. It's like, no, she did that because uh, 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 Micah and Aiko, who are, you know, couple, grandmother and grandfather of Mara, they kind of knew their son, Reverend Reed, was evil even when he was like a child. So Maybe they like didn't... when he was a kid, he was already cooking up weird numerology shit and they're like, I yeah. don't think we should give him the gold. Yeah, <laughs> and so they were like, all right, we're going to keep it from this guy and like just <laughs> hope that maybe he pops out some good grandkids or something. Um, <laughs> or that maybe, you know, maybe uh, descendants of the other people in the crew would find it. So, you know, in order to kind of still keep the map but not make it obvious Iko embroidered it into the quilt and then you know gave it to Mara because they were like well she's our last hope yeah also <laughs> she was to be the clear it's not like the quilt had a big red x on it and no, saying like no. the gold be here it was like little drawings of things that were around the place where the safe was buried in a certain town in Texas yeah it's just a scenic it's just like a scenic quilt but so you wouldn't know it was a technically a treasure map anyway it was well done um Lastly, I just want to talk about how the I feel Mara and Ethan and their relationship is very convincing. They both seem like real people. Um, whenever they talk, this is a big one for me, their speech is not a caricature of black speech for once in a book, which is great. I feel like so often we read black characters and people use this, I don't know, like, I don't know, I would say racist or bordering on racist ways um, to write their speech. And this is not the case in this book. <laughs> so that was nice. No, they, they talk normal, like, like, like people humans. that are risen, that, you know, grew up in America would talk. Yeah. And, and it was just refreshing to not have to like contend with that. Um, on top of that, the the sort of testiness of their relationship, you know, it has the classic underpinnings of a story where it's like, well, if you just talk to each other, if you just said the thing, you know, you wouldn't have this misunderstanding. But even then, the misunderstandings aren't teased out so ludicrously. Like, there's one point where Mara finds a notebook of Ethan's and it has Davis Conroy's name and phone number written out. And all of a sudden she's like, oh, my God, he's betrayed me. He's really, you know, working for yeah. Davis Conroy. And she's about to stab the dude essentially when he comes back and he's able to sort not talk her down but he's just like what are you talking about please explain yourself and then mara does say something and he comes back with i here's why i legitimately had no idea and she, they are able to suss it out that in fact this is one big coincidence in a way and i thought yeah. that was a really well done version of the misunderstanding that could spool out but you know if people just talk to each other like they normally would and Mara doesn't just run off immediately as a lot she of other characters she do she in other just stories. stab him with a pen in the neck and the car and then take off running you know um 
yeah it, i agree with you that's that's a really good uh example of some really i don't know yeah more genuine aspects of the story and stuff um, when they don't want to reveal things to each other there's an emotional reason underpinning it where mm -hmm. mara doesn't want to talk about all the reasons where why she left ethan suddenly until she has been with him for some time and feels safe around him again essentially yeah like i totally buy all of the internal thoughts and all of the conversations characters have it's just very like i said genuine convincing i believe these characters so this is a big thing for me because this is something that we constantly have problems with in almost every book we read <laughs> So it was nice to feel like, oh, someone really did a good job, you know, incorporating, uh, I don't know, real real human nature into, the, into these characters. I will say, I mean, and this might be our segue into things we don't like, but that really only holds true for Ethan and Mara, right? Yes. Uh, it's yeah. only well, uh, those two that you I really think, get that. I think Leslie and yeah, she's Ico somewhat are fine. So, yeah, th those two are sort of like the B tier where they have a little... You're not getting internal monologue from them that much, but right. their but reactions are... to things and their, and their dialogue still is believable. But then you have all of the villains. All right, yeah, let's... All right, so we're going to move on to the things that were not good. First on the list for both of us, villains. Cartoon Chris, villains, man. Just cartoon-ass <laughs> villains here. Like, so one-dimensional only motivated by greed and or rape like look i know that those people exist i guess but i just would have liked more compelling bad guys rather than like good goon bad goon and evil end boss like that's all we get in this book <laughs> and and quite honestly mara's dad is a way better villain than the three we focus on in the book and he's kind of just like a sort of a background villain in the prequel that you don't get to read because yeah, he's Mara just window tells dressing you. to Mara's backstory more than an actual villain in the story. But he is a but in my mind he is a better vi a villain I he the he has a better idea for a villain because you understand his weird religious animus and how complicated that can be and like the family dynamics and a religious cult. I mean it's just it just feels <laughs> Davis Conroy has some of that because he is a descendant of Reese Conroy, as it is revealed later. And mm -hmm. so he has some background into that's how he kind of gets wrapped up in this and how he knows about this at all is that Reese was his, um, I believe, father, actually. Was the case with mm, him? Yeah, you might be right. He might be older. He might be a generation before Amar and Ethan. But anyway, yeah, the villains and a lot of, like Chris said, a lot of the accessory characters were pretty, like, cardboard cutouty. Which, you know, I I don't love, Even like, yeah. but I understand that when you're writing a, you know, 300 and something page action romance, like, you can't. She spent a lot of time making the main characters really believable, and I'm guessing she was, like, not interested in spending all that time on every other character. And yeah, like, why do we have like, to know that? Why is Rabe such an unrepentant shithole of a person? I just but, think though that like a couple of sentences here and there yeah, could have some, just could have uh, just elevated all those extra people and yeah the villains are just not even just, Guffin the sort of like the good goon who like wants to treat Mara well despite capturing her and he's the one that actually holds Ray back a lot from like just outright assaulting and murdering Mara on the spot he's really just sort of this like almost comic relief character because yeah. of that, he's just there to be like, oh, I treat the wi the lady well, please, sir. Like, yeah, you expect him to be, like, in a tux the whole time. Yeah, it was it was a little, it was a little weird. Um, so similarly, as much as the story had a lot, good, a lot of good things going for it, you kind of know that neither of the main characters are going to die or get anything less than the perfect ending, which to me is sort of a bummer. Um... But I guess it's not it's not as big of a sin because at least these characters are like well written and generally likable. Uh so you're you are kind of rooting for them, whereas I think a lot of the books we've read before, the author thinks they've written someone well like likable and that you want to root for, but you actually hate them and then they get a good mm -hmm. ending and you're like, fuck this. 
<laughs> so, I mean, at least that. But I, I do find the picture perfect ending where nothing bad happens annoying. And there's a ton of coincidences in yeah. this book that just happen to work out in their favor. And you know, a couple of those in a story, that's fine. It's totally believable that a couple of coincidences would pop up. But I mean, you have the hidden escape tunnel in the warehouse just being there, even though they don't talk about it. And for like a couple of chapters, they're like, "We're trapped in the warehouse." Oh, but wait, there's a tunnel here that I kind of just mentioned. Yeah, and then like when right at the beginning when Mara, when Ethan rescues Mara, it's in this like Looney Tunes sequence where she runs into an alley and there's like, oh no, a wall blocking her her way. And she's like, what am I going to do? And then there's a door with no handles or anything on the outside. It just swings open and Ethan just whoop, just pulls her in <laughs> and closes it. And it's like... What? In How? addition to, okay, here's another thing that I didn't love. Um, so Davis Conroy owns that warehouse that Ethan is working in. He has access to the blueprints, which he uses later to find out that there's a hidden escape tunnel that Rabe and Guffin just didn't know about. If you own the building, wouldn't you have, like, if you have access to the blueprints, maybe you've seen them, you might know about a loading dock that's in there? Because if well, it's a whole dock, just... even well, if it's no. hidden... Well, Chris, he's a big rich guy. I don't think rich guys like that buy buildings and inspect the blueprints. So I feel like that's actually reasonable but, for him to not But he know. waits too long. Once he knows he does Ethan wait and too Mara long. are in there, he could have pulled the blueprints immediately <laughs> yes. Yes. and been like, oh, there's a, just go in the tunnel over here. You can or grab I don't. Or I don't know, walked in because he owns the building? Like, yeah. <laughs> And just resolved it all there. Like, I, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, com it's again, fucking Looney Tunes villain shit where it just takes forever to come up with a plan, even though he could have solved it in 30 minutes. Yeah, some other useless coincidences here. So Linda the cop being just at there at the right moment at the diner that Mara dashes into. And also Linda being a cop. Yes, <laughs> to be helpful there. Mara um, knew her from high school, and yeah. she just happened to be a cop now. Leslie having access to the particular cave system where this key has been hidden for decades yeah. because she's a geologist. And not just a geologist, but a geologist that happens to go there every year and is thus yeah. friendly with the security. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sebastian. Sebastian is just literally there to help Mara and Ethan out of the final escape sequence from Davis Conroy's office. And nothing else. He's barely. Oh no! He he also gets them a hotel room so they can fuck. <laughs> yeah, the, you got a key aspect there, so they don't have to use any credit cards or anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we don't know anything about who Sebastian is. He's just he may as well be a fucking robot. Like I don't know. Yeah. Mara just calls him. I three have procured times. for you the fuck room. Also, I will assist in the escape so that you can fuck more. <laughs> Sebastian out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole him showing up at the escape. Yeah, I agree with you. There are way too many conveniences. One, one last thing, actually, that I saw on the list here before is, what? okay. Um, you might have to help me with the pronunciation here of this Greek letter, but Davis Conroy's company is Key Holdings Company or Chai Holdings Company. I think it's Kai, but yeah. I, whatever, yeah. It's, it's a Greek letter, obviously, and so this man who has this whole evil plot where he's trying to get some hidden gold that centers around the research of Greek letters being tattooed on bodies named his holding company after that when he hires someone to do the research for <laughs> like and like Ethan didn't know like he was like oh just some guy just hired me I don't know what possible connection he could have to anything when he his fucking named after some his company after Greek letters too I don't know man well, it's just some like mustache twirly shit to be doing. Well, and his last name is Conroy, which is the last name of one of the guys in the original heist crew. And, like, I'm pretty sure they they knew that because of the research they had done. Yeah, it's like, how did, how did, how are you not suspicious of this? I don't understand. Again, Looney Tunes shit. Um, so there is, there, uh, oh, you know what? Shit, I forgot, uh, I forgot to talk about this. This particular, like, grammatical technical error, not grammatical, te uh, technical error that was bothering me throughout the whole book. For some reason, the author just kept doing this thing where she would create sentence fragments. Like, whenever, uh, it was mostly when characters were thinking, like Mara or Ethan were thinking about things. 
to sort of, I guess she was trying to show maybe the stuttered pattern of thoughts, but like, don't end a sentence and then start a sentence fragment. We have a plethora of punctuation in the English language that you can use, like a comma, a dash, a <laughs> semicolon. <laughs> like, I, I just was, it was so annoying. And it kept happening. Uh, I highlighted some of them. Oh, actually, right at the beginning, there's one. The teeth that had gone missing had been lost to fistfights and barroom brawls, but Reese still liked to think he was a handsome devil, period. Even with his bare ass hanging out, period. Like, why is that not a comma? Why? <laughs> I, I, and, and I know this sounds like, oh, Paris being pedantic, but it happened a lot. And I, it just was infuriating because the rest of it was so well edited. There were no other problems. I think I caught two typos. There was one phrase that I thought was just gross. Uh, I think Ethan says, like, his throat is tighter than a virgin at some point. And I was like, yeah. ew, why would you say that, Stacey Abrams? What? No. I mean, maybe she was thinking, like, this might be something that, like, a man in the early 2000s we forgot to say I, there was, there was early a similar, 2000s, but it was like kind of gross there was a weird funny turn of phrase to me it describes like ethan's demeanor or actually it might be um arthur's demeanor someone is described as silent and deadly so <laughs> i was like oh this person is just a fart mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah, I don't know. Like, just use a comma or a hyphen or a semicolon or, or something for a dramatic pause rather than creating sentence fragments. So frustrating. Um, and I remember at the, at the beginning, we were both really worried that this was going to turn into another, like, uh, creepy, creepy descriptions of women thing because Aiko at the beginning, uh, spoiler, she's the one who was tattooing in the circus tent at the beginning, is described as having creamy skin and we were like uh oh but then that never happened again so it's good uh yeah i don't know it was mo most of the writing was fine i it was it was good i didn't have any real problems like i said there were two typos right towards the end and just other than the sentence fragment thing and then that one really like tasteless description it was it was solid so i think that's the only yeah, the only like technical stuff. Yeah, that technically I done fine. Pacing laid yeah. out well. Well you know, edited, nothing... tightly edited. Yeah, not yeah. much, um, not much to complain about there. And like that, so we are still trying to highlight some instances. Just I think to be fair in a way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and let's let's talk about this this last uh thing that we had a problem with. So uh, as as much as I think we both felt the um romance sex scenes were well done. There was one line that <laughs> really could have just been struck. Well, well I mean, no I don't, one... actually, I don't think it should have been struck, Paris, because it also exemplifies to me the dorkiness of Mara and her, like, relationship. Ethan, yeah. It's sort of the do, you want, do, you want to, do you want to read, like, the sent sentences before and maybe one after just so people like, um, I don't. Ha I don't have that on me right now, so if you could oh, I can, search it. Oh, I can do it. It's, it's a really okay. good one. All right. In hushed sounds, he stripped away the red cotton, the black lace, and lingering doubt. When the khaki shorts fell between them, he marveled at the slender lines, the strength and delicacy of her body. He brushed the sweep of taut golden breasts, crested by a deeper hue that entreated he taste, that he feast. Okay, <laughs> when the khaki shorts fell between them, it's just... That's some lines from a New England porno shit right there. <laughs> We're on the Cape yeah, together. We just got off the boat. <laughs> yeah, are we in Kiev, Texas, or are, are we on Nantucket? Are we on the vineyard? Are we on the vineyard? Did we just... Did we just did Get those khakis off, honey. As, as the khaki shorts fell between them, <laughs> our arm pushed the ice culottes off the table, and they made a huge fucking mess, and then we fucked in it because we didn't can. It was hot. And we don't have AC. Because we're in old fucking New England cottages. Dude, I was sweating balls out there and my balls were hanging out because of the sex that I was having, actually. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it was great. Let me tell you. Oh, and uh, actually, that's also another example of a sentence fragment for no fucking reason. <laughs> uh, when it says uh, it, that entreated he taste, that's a period, and then that he feast is a sentence, a fragment. It's like why wasn't it just entreated he taste 
dash that he feast if you really wanted like a dramatic pop oh fucking god it drives me nuts anyway and the khaki shorts fell between them as a line i'm never gonna forget <laughs> thank you Stacey Abrams. that is funny Re oh, man. really really quality <laughs> stuff there i need more lines from a new england porno paris <laughs> oh as the sound of Jaws died down in the background, we <laughs> got to business. <laughs> I was trying to get to my lady love, but the MBTA was once again <laughs> out of commission. Once and therefore, again delayed due to smoke in the tunnels. <laughs> I, I had to take the pike instead. I was in traffic for two hours, and when by the time I got there, she had already left for the Sox game. <laughs> And Real. when she came back, her parents were home already since she had to live at home with the parents since the rent was too high elsewhere. <laughs> so we really couldn't get down to business, you see. Uh, I had to wait until they went to church the next morning. I want to talk about this declining birth rate? Let's talk about the rent. If I can't live on my own, you're not getting grandkids. <laughs> I like how this porno is just someone complaining. I mean, that would be very Boston. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, that's how you get worked up in Boston. You gotta complain <laughs> at each other for a little while. That's, gets do you know what? I do blowing. fucking hate the MBTA. Come here. <laughs> well, it gets the dunks flowing, you know? <laughs> uh, the caffeine has got me going. I've got enough, just enough ice in me. Come on, it's only going to last another 30 minutes. I'll give you extra cream. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now this porno is taking place inside of a Dunkin' Donuts, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> I'm crying. Oh, no. Whew, oh. Okay, I'm going to drink this. The soundtrack. Okay, fine. the soundtrack is just Dropkick Murphy's <laughs> 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 Fucking mighty mighty boss tones sometimes. That's all we've got. Um, uh, I never had to touch some wood <laughs> until just right now. Oh wow. Is that even the same is that from either of those bands? Yes, that's that's the impression that I get by the mighty mighty boss tones. Oh, okay. I alright. <laughs> Wow, if I could never hear either of those bands ever again in my entire life, my life would be improved by oh. approximately half a percent. <clears throat> Mighty Mighty Boston's still out there. Recently released a song um, it was about... Dropkick Murphy's. They both are. They both are, but Mighty Mighty Boston's recently released a song uh, talking about the uh, George Floyd murder? Um, really? Except it's still like a very, it's like called like the Ballad of George or something, but it's still like a very upbeat ska thing. And like the start of the music video is like some guy like dancing to ska trumpets. And it seems like that he's happy so about what happens. Oh, so inappropriate I... weird. <laughs> yes. Why? It is. Would... Why? God, now, now I'm going to have to look at this because it just <laughs> seems beyond absurd i god i don't know well hopefully they got permission from the floyd family because that i mean i guess you don't technically have to but it no, would be the right yeah. thing to do uh, you know <laughs> the well, ethical anyway, thing to do we've digressed uh, very far out from our point here so like, anyway all right we've we've done we've we've had our new england porno sketch uh which we just kind of stumbled into now, let's, you know, speaking of sexy stuff, let's talk about romance novel dude names, because Chris and I apparently have very different ideas. Chris had a note that said, oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I, I'm just going to, because like Ethan is such a romance novel hot dude name to me, like. See, and, and I don't think so, probably because I actually work with someone named Ethan, so it seems like a very regular name to me i don't know it doesn't no it, no the, the you know usually the names are normal guy names but there's a certain subsection of dude names i think that fit into this hot dude category or usually is attributed to a romance novel lead okay something like a connor or a brett tyler perhaps a noah also part of that as well i believe i don't know i don't See, I don't agree with you. I think romance novel dude names are always like 
weird a little weird those are all regular ass names but there's like tiers of regular ass dude names that like right but like shitty romance novel dude names are like crispin and maximilian (laughs) yeah that's a different category and like (laughs) stuff like that i mean that's what i think about when i come when i think of like dumb romance novel dude names everything you said is just a normal name I think, but yes, with, within the normal name sphere, there is also a tiering of names that are reserved for the hot guys, and then other names that, you know, you'd leave for the normal dudes in your in your romance novel. Like, I don't think anyone named Dustin is going to be the hot guy lead in your novel. Oh, I think so. Oh, so that's a hot guy name for you. Okay, so let's, I'm going to just throw some male names at you, Paris, and you tell me whether you think this would uh, be appropriate. All right. Okay, um, how about a Jimmy? No, definitely not. Yeah, but James might, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I can't really tell you why I feel that way. <clears throat> um, a Jeff to me is like really middle of the road no. kind of thing, right? Yeah, like that's, Je- not, that's not Even a Even with the J or the G, it doesn't really matter. Too much, no. I would say. But but Joffrey sounds like a ridiculous romance guy name. Sure. Um, what about an Andy or an Andrew? No. Mm-mm. I think Andrew might even the Drew perhaps is like mm. sort of on the on the edge there. Yeah, maybe Drew, but not Andrew. And again, I can't. This is just a sense. This is just my kind of. Yeah, this is all gut. This is all. This, this is, is all. Yeah, this is. This is just what I've learned from years of reading bad books. Um, yeah, I don't know. Drew, but not Andy or Andrew. How about Don? Sorry, what? Don or no. Donald. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, no. that name's been kind of ruined for a, a lot of people, I would say. No, definitely not. Um, perhaps a... Oh, Gabe? <laughs> That's No one's hot is named Gabe, I think. Gabriel, though. Yes, I would say Gabriel, that. Gabriel, yes, not Gabe. What about Greg? Nah. Yeah, right. I'm. I mean, we know some nah, plenty of people named Greg, not. and they're fine and all, and all, but it's just not like well, your romance I, yeah. lead. Yeah, we're we're, and I'm I'm looking at this from the lens of someone who writes rom, you know, someone who writes romance novels and is trying to come up with a name, and this is just what I think they might say. How about Jared? Jared is, he's the star of the New England porno, I feel like. Only if it's spelled differently, like J-A-R-R-A-D instead of the standard J-A-R-E-D. I feel like for some reason, that stu- dumber spelling makes sure. it more like romance novel lead. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I found a top tier romance uh, lead name here. Logan. Not that, not that, not that that spelling is bad or anything it's just non-standard i yeah i guess i shouldn't have said dumber it's just non-standard spelling here's a top tier romance novel lead name for you i think Mm -hmm. logan hogan logan logan or hogan logan hogan would not be hot i would say but logan Logan. definitely okay i've seen that in a ton of like romantic lead things okay i'm just gonna give you a couple more here how about just Chris? You know, I think Chris is for me. It feels like a very bog standard name, of course. No, but... yeah, no, it's not. It's not a romance novel lead. I'm yes, sorry. I would. I will Christoph. accept this. Christoph with a K is though. Christian, K-R-I-F. perhaps as well, or Christian. Christian mm. is definitely like a Fifty Shades of Grey name. So like, that is has been elevated. All yeah. right. Okay, one more. Rob. I don't think Rob no. cuts it. <laughs> No, I don't think so. It would have to be, um, hmm, yeah, no, I can't even think of a version of that name. Even Robert Robert. is a little bit too all business. Yeah, I don't think so. Sorry, Robert. Get out of here. Even the Bob nickname is just right out. (laughs) No one sexy is named Bob. And then Robbie, maybe Robbie if it was like a young adult book, like a teenager named Robbie. (laughs) I could kind of see that. Okay, yeah, maybe. All right, this has been ranking hot guy names with terrible book. Uh, if you've man. got your own top tier hot guy names, don't submit them to us. I don't care. <laughs> All right, so can we fix it, Chris? Can we fix it? I mean, for me, it's really the cartoon villains and the coincidences that yeah. really need some reworking, especially with the coincidences more than anything. You could have 
one or two of those things in a book, kind of pick and choose where you really want it to happen. Perhaps yeah. for me, I would have left it at um, Ethan working for Davis Conroy is like one of the major ones I would have left in. And I don't know, maybe the Sebastian thing or or the Linda thing, like one of the two. The Leslie having access to the caves thing, I feel, is right out. You got to have some other way in there, man. Like, that's just too convenient for me. Yeah, yeah. And if you're going to have the escape tunnel, at least make it less, you know, formalized than this is actually a loading dock and is totally on the blueprints to the building that the villain owns. You got to cut one piece of yeah. that out for it to make any sense. Yeah, I agree with you. Like an unlisted, unblueprint, like bootlegger tunnel, or you know, the Davis Conroy doesn't own the literal building. <laughs> one of just one of those yeah. things needs to be for that to make yeah, a little I, bit more sense. I agree with you. It's yeah, gotta gotta get rid of those many of those coincidences. Um, or yeah, like her being pulled in through a door without a handle by her ex-boyfriend right before she's about to be shot to death. I mean, come on. Like, it's just a little too much. Um, Again, that would have been fine if it wasn't amongst all the other right, stuff. Right. There's just too many. I agree. The layering of coincidences is uh, it's making this making this whole little book cake fall down. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, like, there's barely anything I would really change here. I agree with Chris that the coincidences are a problem and the cardboard villains. But uh, again, I'm in agreement with him in that if the coincidences were just cut down, it would it would really. Yeah, I think I think it'd be almost perfect. It was also that consistently annoying technical choice where I don't know, she just kept the author just kept using sentence fragments instead of just using a dash or, a, you know, like, a, sorry, a hyphen semicolon or comma i i don't i don't understand it was just annoying um and i think the ending too where everything turns out perfectly and they get all the gold and the religious artifacts and the davis conroy dies and i don't know it just would be a little better if they had to sacrifice or lose something mm -hmm. like if something bad happened like maybe leslie actually fucking dies or like gets severely injured or they lose the gold or the artifacts you know like in the end they literally get they have their fucking cake and eat it too sorry to keep talking about cake i guess it's on my mind for some <laughs> reason but they just get everything in the ending they get their love you know leslie is just cool with giving up on on liking ethan you know it's just everything really washes out too perfectly at the mm -hmm. end so i would also change that but like honestly solid book i'd say it's a few leagues beyond an airport read still in the popcorn uh, i'd I say the... i'd say it's good airport read is all is all i'm willing to give it well, I would I disagree because we've given le books that were not as good the title the accreditation of decent airport books. So, I think that while this is still in sort of the popcorny realm, it's much better than other books kind of oh, yeah, in that okay. in that category. I'll, I'll acquiesce to that, but I don't know how many leagues ahead it would be. Just maybe a couple steps. Yeah. Um and if so I think if somebody was looking for like an action or a romance, I would recommend this book to them. You know, not something I would typically pick up, but if someone's looking for a romance, I'd be like, hey, this one's really engaging and kind of, I don't know, has some original aspects to it. I think yeah. the characters are really believable and well-written. It honestly reminded me a little bit of Love. It was like Lovecraft Country Light, where like you had these strong, complicated Black characters, a focus on Black love, and an intriguing story that's a little creepy. I mean, obviously, Lovecraft Country has, like, a lot more going on in terms of gender, race, white supremacy, and horror. But, like, I don't know. I could see HBO making this book into, like, a series or a movie or something. Yeah, um, probably so... a one-shot movie. So, yeah. Well well done. Well done, Stacey Abrams. What what can't Stacey Abrams, Stacey I was, Abrams do? I wanted to segue into, like, a final discussion point for us here on this. Um, and I think it's something that we should ask ourselves because, undoubtedly, um, some YouTube commenters will ask it of us. <laughs> Are we giving this book a lot more credit than we might give others because we sympathize with the political leanings of the author? No, absolutely not. Her political leanings are not even in the book. True, they're not in the book, but are we willing to give her more credit for things because we like the work that she has done? No. No. 
I don't know. Okay. I think it's pretty, pretty I, I clear wanna, for me. I, I feel that way too. I just want to have it kind of discussed here for a second. And the reason being is because it seems like Stacey Abrams is someone that does her research and plans her work before she does it. And that's indicative in her voting rights activism and in her novel writing. So yeah. it's just sort of it seems to be, at least for Stacey Abrams, the way she approaches any work that she's doing. I am sure that there are some Democrat fiction books out there that I would fucking hate. My number one target that I haven't read, but I bet is some fucking trash, is that Bill Clinton, James Patterson, oh, the president's God. daughter thing that I see yeah. every time I walk into a bookstore. I bet there's that shit many, is horrendous. Dude, there's several versions of that out with varying presidents and stuff. And yeah, like, fuck that. I, I don't want anything to do with that. I mean, we haven't read it, so we are judging the book by its cover, but I just Bill Clinton and James Patterson. I cannot imagine they did a great job. Yeah, yeah, two two people who I do not have uh, good feelings towards. Yeah, <laughs> who seem to have just coasted by in a lot of senses and uh, doing a lot of actual yeah, work. Yep. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yes. Yeah, we, we won't get into that, but um, <laughs> no, I don't think that we're giving her undue credit here. I think that she just genuinely wrote a, a better book. I mean, you know, if we want to compare this. Let's talk about Flashback. That was yes. a super right-wing author. And there were things about that book that I liked. I actually thought that um, the world that he built, you know, of this, like, uh, sort of near-future apocalyptic version of America was interesting. Although I... And, and, like, the drug, Flash, like, I thought that was a brilliant idea, actually. I thought it was great. But just how fucking racist and shitty yeah. everything was. Yeah. It was just so hard And how every character had to be informed by his right-wing perspective on how people yeah. should act down to, like, the liberal professor that found out he was wrong. <laughs> yeah, and his life was, I don't know, his life was ruined because he was a liberal. Yeah, I mean, so there were, and and I think that, uh, shit, what was his name? What was that author's name? Dan Simmons. Dan Simmons, yeah. So I think Simmons did do a lot of, like, planning out and, like, sculpting his his story fairly well. But this is, I mean, they're very, they're actually very good comparisons because they're both these sort of popcorn action thrillers uh, with way too many coincidences. But Stacey Abrams' version is much more compelling and it doesn't, yeah, I don't know. You don't get distracted by all the insane propaganda because there's none in this book. So even yeah. if you are like someone who's, I don't know, a right wing extremist and you like romance novels, you'll probably like Stacey Abrams' book yeah. because it has nothing to do with her politics or anything. Um, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe that maybe that's inaccurate. But I, I just think that like, yeah, I don't think there's anything about this that makes me like it more because it's Stacey Abrams and not Dan Simmons. I mean, if Dan, Dan Simmons has actually written some notably good books uh, that we haven't read, but he got his start writing some, uh, what I've, what I've been told is some really good sci-fi stuff, uh, sci-fi fantasy kind of stuff in the, I want to say eighties, but then as his career in life progressed, he got, you know, more and more kind of ardently conservative to the point where you know, uh, he was really injecting a lot of kind of ex sort of ext I don't know if I want to say yeah, sort of extremist ideas in his work, which is at the point where he wrote Flashback a couple of years <laughs> ago, um, which is where we you know entered into his repertoire and was and was and were kind of horrified. But um, anyway, yeah, I just really wanted to have a moment of discussion on that because I think it's worth to just sort of self-examine for why you felt the way you did instead of just going like. Well, no, I don't. I just don't think that was how I. F oh no, sure. I mean, and honestly, I we picked this book because we thought it would be bad because yes. we were like, what you know, we were like, Stacey Abrams does a lot of great work, and I I certainly find her to be an inspiring person. But what's the chance that she could also? What's the chance that her romance novel writing career is also good? Right? I was like expecting this to be total trash. I, mean, I don't know how wasn't. much of a bestseller she was because you know another funny point about this was that you know it was written under Selena Montgomery, but now being re-released with like it's Stacey Abrams as Selena Montgomery under it, which is pretty funny when you're you know you make this pen name so that you can have some level of removal from your 
fiction work, but then turns out you got more famous from your real world work. So to sell your books more, you're going to put your real name <laughs> on top of your fake name. Yes. I don't know why she doesn't just become Stacey Selena Montgomery Abrams. I mean, just <laughs> change the whole thing. You know, just sound real fancy. You got two last names. You got a, now you get a new middle name. I mean, you know. Done. Yeah, it's just kind of funny to me the way that worked out. Yeah, it, it is funny. Um, but anyway, no, I think that I think that this is genuinely a better story uh, and and better done than yes. than flashback, for instance. Although I, you know, obviously they're not. It's not a one to one comparison here, but that was the the best thing I could think of yes, off the top of my head that we've agree. reviewed. Okay. Uh, anyway, well, also, also, Chris, it doesn't matter what we say. YouTube commenters just yeah. fucking sling mud. That's what they yes. do. They're just no. I understand things. that. I'm not like out here trying to you know put points just because of them, but it, I think it's worth examining. Yeah, I I agree. All right. Well, this is it. We are done for today. So thank you, patrons. Thank you to Dari, Greg, Veronica, Will, D, Jared. Jared, J-A-R-R-A-D. That's where I got that romance novel name, Jared. <laughs> Lynn, Sinia, Yakub, Bobby Black Cat, Jensina, Licorice, Lycoris? Not really sure. I'm going to say Lycoris. Elliot, Kieran, Martin, J, Scott, Luchek, CTAP1, Miri, Yanka, Robert Allen Cook III, David, Julius, Anya and Anonymous. Thank you. Thank you to our you glorious patrons for making this possible. If you also want to help support the show, you can subscribe and or watch our videos on YouTube and leave a comment. You can like a video. You can also donate money to us um, over on our Patreon. So patreon.com slash terrible book club. You can gain access to extra bonus content like videos of us. So you can see our faces. Uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 style commentary on bad TV and movies, outtakes, and some other random stuff like Chris sometimes puts up audio tracks that he writes for the show. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Goodreads if you're on those platforms. Otherwise, you can send us uh, a message on many of those platforms or send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail.com to contact us directly. If you can, we'd really love if you shared the show on social media or told at least one person about it. And uh, if you could review the show, that'd also be great. And when we get new reviews, we read them on air. So review the show. Get get some minutes on TVC. Sometimes we read emails, too. We do. Yeah, sometimes sometimes we'll read emails. One time we got an email with cat pictures, and that fucking yes. ruled. Once that was again, the best fan email ever. Out, send the pets. Send us pictures of, I don't know, your pets, your favorite books, you know, whatever. It's, it's fun. Just let us know fun you're out there. That's all. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I think that's it for me, Chris. Yeah, I'm going to say that I have nothing more to say. There are no more hidden sins. <laughs> <It's a> really <laughs> bad segue out there. Uh, oh, no, I'm covered in asses. Yeah. Uh, see you later, Paris. <laughs> Bye, Chris. <laughs> <laughs>